You're listening to Deliberate Living, a podcast that inspires, empowers, and encourages listeners to live life more authentically. My name is Holly Priestley, and I'm a full-time nomad and creator who has been living in my 1997 Ford van since January 1st of 2019. I travel the United States with my dog, learning how to live with more authenticity. I explore different ways people choose to ditch the prescribed life we've all been sold and live on their terms, finding freedom and happiness however they choose. Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of the Deliberate Living Podcast. I am your host, Holly Priestley, and this week I wanted to make an episode kind of that just wraps up all of the logistics of living in a van. These are uh, a little bit of my, you know, FAQs, my frequently asked questions, my listener Q&As, and then also just a lot of questions that new vanners have or the van curious have um, about the you know, the brass tacks uh, logistics of living in a van and how that works and how you handle certain things that you don't necessarily have to handle living in a house. It just is part of living in a house. And so before I get started, I want to just remind everybody that this is an audience supported podcast and it is not sponsored by any brands. There will not be any really annoying ad breaks. And so if you'd like to keep it that way, I could use your help. I mean, you're the audience and I need your help to help, uh, keep this podcast going and keep it free of annoying ads. So there are a number of ways you can do that. If you like this podcast, if you could go ahead and, you know, like it, give it a a five star or a thumbs up or whatever it is on the platform that you are consuming it on, that would be great. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and subscribe. Um, Leave me a comment or a review or send this episode or any other episode to someone who you think needs to hear it, someone who you know is asking these questions, someone who is curious about this lifestyle, that would be awesome. Also, there are costs that go into creating this podcast, and so if you want to help offset some of those, I have a Venmo and a PayPal set up for, you know, like a little one-time donation, Um, and then I also have a Patreon, and if you become a monthly supporter, you know, you can get additional behind-the-scenes information from me, maybe even some, you know, listener Q&A live streams. Uh, You get to see a lot of the art that I'm making behind the scenes as well. And I recently upgraded some of my tiers to actually include physical mail, snail mail from me to you. So that's another way you can help support the podcast. And so without further ado, let's get into some of the frequently asked questions about the logistics of living in a van. The first question is, how do you handle mail living on the road? And so there are quite a few ways you can get mail on the road or, you know, navigate needing to have an address. The two of those things are actually really different and the way that you solve them could vary depending on your needs. Um, And so what works best for you on the road or for someone you know on the road will boil down to your resources and your unique specific needs. For me, for the last two and a half years, I have used my parents' address as my permanent physical address anytime I need some such address for, uh, you know, a government form or something like that. It also benefits me that they live at the address, and so if I do get any physical mail, um, you know, I know where it's going, and they can hold on to it for me. I also have gotten mail at various places uh, depending on where I am in the country and what I need at the time. Like, yes, I can still order things online and have them shipped to me or, you know, sometimes you need to have really important things mailed to you. And so having an address that you're not at all the time can be a hassle. And there are a number of ways you can actually get mail on the road as well. And so for me, over the last two and a half years, sometimes that's been getting mail at friends' houses or at, you know, my brother's houses or at my parents' houses. Um, You can use those, you know, Amazon lockers or things like that if you're ordering from Amazon, which I don't recommend, but it still happens to the best of us. I've also used general delivery at various post offices with varying degrees of success. Some post offices, you order general delivery, you go in and you walk out with your package in like two minutes. And some places I've had to go back time and time again, and things have gone wrong, and it doesn't always work out. So general delivery is wonderful, and it totally works some of the time. So that's another option that a lot of people use. You can also pay for a mail service. So these seem to range from, you know, $10 a month to maybe $100 a month, depending on how much mail you're getting and what you want 
the service to do with the mail that you're getting. Some of them can qualify as an actual physical address and some of them don't. It really just depends on which company you're going through. And I looked into these uh, services a few years ago and ultimately decided that they weren't right for me at the time. That doesn't mean I won't use them in the future, but I just haven't used them yet. So I don't have any to recommend to you guys, but there are a lot of resources out there in terms of these mailing services and then also reviews and what they offer and all of that sort of thing. The second question today is how do you insure your van and all the things in it? Insurance can be a hassle and there's not really a one size fits all solution for it and yeah it's really just going to depend on on your rig your needs what state you live in what kind of insurances are available to you and all of that insurance is incredibly important and i definitely don't recommend skimping to be honest and so for me because my van is not officially an RV, it wasn't converted by professional RV conversion companies. Um, I don't have RV insurance on it. If you can get RV insurance, I would definitely recommend doing that, but it can be a hassle, especially with self-converted vans. So something to look into for sure. It's not an absolute no. I have seen some vans get RV insurance. There's usually just a lot of like hoops that you have to jump through, especially during the build process to get it certified. Um, so for me, because I built my van out myself, it's not an RV. I do have just regular old car insurance on it. Um, and then I also have a renter's policy on top of that that covers basically the conversion and everything that I keep inside the van. And so a renter's policy is something that I highly, highly, highly recommend that you have if you're living in a van, especially. Um, and it, it does require you to have a physical address and all of that, which I talked about in the previous question. Um, but the renter's policy is how I'm covering essentially the conversion, as well as all of my things that are in the van. And so between the car insurance uh, and my renter's insurance, I am paying just under $100 a month right now for the two of them for like specifically vehicle related insurances. And again, insurance is a hassle and it depends on where you live. It depends on where the car is registered. It depends on what kind of insurance agents you have around you. Some of them are really flexible and willing to work with you. Mine is incredible. And some of them are less understanding. Some of them really just don't have a lot of insurance products to offer you. And it's, it's kind of a weird gray area being in a van and trying to insure it. But insurance is really, really, really important. Driving is like hands down the most dangerous thing that we do and we do it all the time. And we fucking live in a thing that drives. So insurance is really important. Be sure you get some. Where do you find water, fresh water for drinking, cooking, etc.? And so water is a really interesting thing. Uh, based on my travels, mostly around the western half of the United States, it seems like some places water is more abundant than others. And I have found usually where there isn't much water naturally occurring, you know, like a desert, you can find free water fill stations all over the place. Gas stations, laundromats, um, storage facilities, grocery stores, public parks, the list goes on. It seems like in places like Arizona, um, New Mexico, Utah, anywhere where water is like hard to find in nature, it seems like it's easier to find for free in you know public areas, developed areas. And in contrast to that, where water is more abundant in nature, naturally occurring, it can be harder to find like free water sources out and about to refill your jugs. And so most bigger grocery stores, especially still have water available for purchase. You can take your refillable containers into the grocery store, fill them up, pay on your way out. Um, and you know, again, gas stations are really good places to find um, water fill stations as well. Um, and as with the mail and pretty much everything else, if I'm around friends or family, I'll fill up my, my jugs at their houses or you know, using their hoses. Um, on one or two occasions over the last few years, I've filled up uh, in restrooms, like at uh, rest areas and that sort of thing. I don't really recommend this method because it's really challenging to like navigate getting your jug like 
into the bathroom and it doesn't fit in the sink and then you got to fill up a gallon and pour it in the bigger jug it's just it's kind of a lot of hassle um and then also like that kind of water doesn't seem to be quite as I don't know I'm sure it's potable but it just it smells and it tastes a little weird so I don't really like doing that but it's an option especially if you're like at the end of your rope and you don't know where your next water source is going to be but water is really cheap and so, you know, I, I do spend a fair amount of time, like, looking for free water sources, mostly because having to go into a store is kind of annoying. Um, but it's so inexpensive to fill up my, you know, seven-gallon jug of water. It's, like, a dollar or two. It, like, really is not very expensive. So it's worth it to put forth the effort to just make sure that you always have clean, fresh water on hand because you don't want to get dehydrated and sick and all of that. The next question is also water related. How do you, how or where do you dump your gray water and your black water? And so for me, in my van, I don't actually have gray or black water tanks. I don't have them, so I don't have to deal with it. But I do have to be really mindful about both in general. Anyway, my gray water drains straight through the van onto the ground. And so as a result, I'm incredibly mindful about what I put down my sink. I don't use, you know, chemically soaps or anything like that to clean anything in the van, especially dishes. Um, and I don't put anything down the sink that I don't want to pour directly onto the ground because that's exactly where it's going. It can be really easy to like forget that, you know, it's going in the sink, it's going down a drain, you know, and in a house, you don't really think about where that water is going. It's going to a treatment facility anyway, but in a van, without any gray water storage, it's going directly onto the ground. So you have to be super mindful and careful about what you're putting down there. I don't want to put chemicals down there because I don't want to ruin the ground. I also don't want to put like food scraps down there because I don't want to attract animals underneath my van. They can get in my van. There's a lot of holes and crevices and mice and chipmunks and stuff are really small and they can get in there. So I don't do that either. I use white vinegar um, and baking soda for most of my cleaning needs from everything from like my dishes to my surfaces and anything in between and those are natural products so that is fine as far as black water and like bathroom stuff goes i have a bottle and a funnel for liquids and i dump it anywhere most standing peers can be able to pee and for solids, I'm usually out in the woods, and so I go find a good spot, and I dig a hole at least six inches deep, and I bury everything. Except toilet paper, don't bury toilet paper. Pack that out with you, put it in the trash. I know it's gross at first, you'll get used to it. Ultimately, I do not poop on the ground. I dig a hole. It's got to go in a hole. Don't poop on the ground. I talk a lot about this in another podcast that I'm going to link in the show notes. Um, the one about dispersed camping, finding and using dispersed camping. I'll link to that. Um, I talk a lot more about outdoor bathroom use, so I'm not going to go down my rabbit hole or stand on my soapbox or whatever here. Um, but yeah, that's how I handle gray and black water is that essentially I don't have them. I don't have the tanks for them, so I don't have to worry about like where to dump them, but I do have to be mindful about where my gray and black go in general. The next question is, uh, what is your electrical setup? And electrical is one of those things that is everyone does differently as is everything and it can be really scary because you don't know anything about electrical i didn't know anything about electrical at least so it was really scary for me currently i have a single 100 watt panel on the roof of my van and i have an, a 100 amp hour battleborn lithium battery in in the van and so when i first bought my rig i had two old deep cycle batteries um, in the van and they were hooked up only to um, the alternator, so they charge when I'm driving. And then also I have the ability to plug into shore power, but there wasn't solar on the van when I bought it. There were just the batteries that were hooked up to the alternator and um, to the shore power. And those were old and used when I got the van. And then after a year and a half of living in the van, they got really old, they wouldn't hold a charge. It was really, really stressful. And so last year, Right around this time, actually, I upgraded to my lithium battery, and it was expensive. There's a reason most people go for deep cycles, um, because they're a lot cheaper, but the lithiums last longer, and they're more reliable, they're easier to use, um, and for me, it was totally worth it, based on my lifestyle and my plans for the lifestyle as well. 
And so if I were to do it again, if I were to, you know, build another van or add on to mine, I would have at least twice, maybe three times as much solar on my roof and an extra battery. My current setup is fine. It totally works for me. It's worked for me for the last two and a half years, you know, with the battery upgrade last year. But I do find myself really like budgeting my power. Um, and, you know, I also use a lot of power for my work. I charge my computer and my phone and my cameras and everything else. Um, and so more power would just be more peace of mind, like not a necessity, but a nicety. So that's something that I would do. Currently have 100 uh, watts and 100 amp hours. Um, and with the lithium, you need probably twice as much watts as amp hours anyway. Um, and I would want twice as much of everything <laughs> anyway for myself moving forward. All right, what kind of gas mileage does your van get? And so just a reminder, Eloise Van Gogh is a 1997 Ford E350 high top uh, with an extended body. She a big girl, big van. And she gets an average of about 14 miles to the gallon. The highest I've ever seen her get over the last few years has been about 16. And the lowest I've ever seen her get was right around 10. And I check my mileage every single time I fill up without fail, um, mostly out of habit and general curiosity. And so unsurprisingly, cities are really hard for us with all of the idling and the stopping and the starting and the traffic and all of those things, highways and back roads. And like basically most of the driving that we do gives us about that 14 mile mark, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. Um, I'm really happy with 14 miles per gallon uh, for a rig this big, this old, this heavy, etc. If you don't live in a van, 14 miles per gallon might sound like really paltry and pathetic. But when I was test driving vans, I, I drove some that got about eight miles to the gallon. And I know a number of people who live in older vehicles or bigger vehicles who do average about eight to 10 miles per gallon. And I knew that those weren't gonna be sustainable for my lifestyle. And so I'm super happy with 14. Eloise has a huge gas tank, uh, at least 30 gallons. I have never gotten her tank like so totally empty. Um, so I'm not sure exactly how much she has, but I've definitely put over 30 gallons of gas in her before. And so as a result, sometimes that means that filling her up with gas can cost me over a hundred dollars a tank. Like it really, like, especially in California where things are very expensive. Um, and that is like really expensive and it adds up. And so slow travel has been a huge game changer for me over, you know, the last year with the pandemic and everything else. Um, but there's just something about having a full tank of gas. There always has been ever since I was like 15 and, you know, had my first car, like having a full tank of gas has always felt really good to me. It brings me a lot of peace and it makes me feel like happy and abundant and free. And so it's totally worth it. And, you know, if you think about it, paying a couple hundred dollars in gas every month is still cheaper than rent in most cities, especially in Denver where I was living prior to moving into the van. So it evens out in that way. The next question is how slash where do you shower? And this one is interesting. Uh, I get this question a lot and it's kind of funny when I think about all the places I've showered over the last few years. Um, I've showered at truck stops, I've showered in gyms, I've showered in you know community rec centers, at campgrounds, obviously at friends and family's houses. Um, I've showered in rivers, uh, not using chemically soaps and stuff, and like at laundromats and stuff. Every like community, you know, big city, small town, something in the middle, they all kind of have like different showering opportunities available to you. <laughs> and so uh, sometimes where you have the opportunity to shower um, can be kind of funny and uh, unexpected, to be honest. And the prices for showers range. Some of them have been free, and some of them, I think the most I ever paid for a shower was like 10 or $12. And that's a lot of money for a shower. My favorite way to shower, hands down, beyond all of those, is just outside of my van, wherever I happen to be camping. Um, the first year and a half I lived in the van, I had a, a solar shower bag. Um, and that worked really well to hang off the side of the van and wash my hair. 
um, and that broke some time ago. I tried to replace it and could never find one that I liked enough, and so now I just use a bowl and a cup to like wash the water over my hair. And I did this even when my hair was really super long, and it's a little bit easier now that it's shorter, but not exponentially so, um, in the washing department at least. Uh, and so like, that's how I wash my hair to wash my body. I, I take some sponge baths or I use wet wipes. Um, and I've got, you know, special like face wipes and face wash for my face as well. A lot of vanners will get planet fitness memberships or some other kind of, you know, national gym franchise membership. Um, and I debated getting one. They're not very expensive. Um, I think the ones that let you use any gym anywhere in the country are like 20 bucks a month. So that's pretty reasonable. If you shower once a week, it's $5 a week. And if you have a membership like that and you have gyms available to you, you're probably showering more than once a week. But for me, I spend so much time away from places that have Planet Fitness gyms that getting one is just not worth my time or my money. And so, yeah, once I figured out my system for washing my hair out in the woods and figuring out, you know, how to make it work, even though my head gets really greasy or I've been working out or whatever, uh, that's still my favorite way to shower and not have to, you know, truck all of my stuff into another building and stay in this really small space. And I don't know, it just feels a little strange. But of course, like this is really dependent on the weather and on the seasons and like all of that has to cooperate as well. Like if it's too cold outside or if it's like raining or if it's really windy, like I'm not going to wash my hair outside and make myself get hypothermia. And again, because I live in a vehicle, I do try to live and drive and stay in warmer, more neutral climates most of the time anyway. But yeah, it's just another thing that you kind of have to juggle. How do you manage laundry? Laundry is fun because I didn't do laundry the quote unquote normal way when I lived in a house. <laughs> and so I don't really do laundry the normal way now that I live in a van. Most often, especially over the last year with the pandemic and everything else, I mostly tend to do my laundry when I'm visiting friends or family. Um, and I also really like to do laundry out in the wild, kind of similar to how I wash my hair. I personally never, ever, ever use laundromats ever. It's just a personal preference. A lot of people like laundromats. I don't. I never have. So I just don't use them and I find other ways to keep my clothes clean. So when I'm out in the woods, like I said, very similar to my hair, I'll fill a bowl with warmish water and like a little tiny bit of my all-natural shampoo and I wash my clothes in the bowl that way and rinse and everything and then I hang around camp or I hang around the van to dry. Before the pandemic, when showers were a little bit easier to come by, I would often take my clothes into the shower with me and wash them in the shower and then hang them to dry in or around the van when I was done. And so before I moved into the van, doing my laundry in the shower with me was my absolute favorite way to clean my clothes. And then I would just hang my laundry up in my shower. And so that's kind of how I got used to washing my clothes that way. And that's how I prefer to wash them still. So I'm really glad that I made that switch and kind of had that uh, had that transition before I moved into the van and, and it became a bigger ordeal. So the final question for the logistics of van life is how do you eat healthy without a fridge? I think a lot of people when they're thinking about van life or like doing it themselves or thinking about other people doing it, you know, they're thinking about like hiking food or camping food, um, you know, which is a lot of sandwiches or like the backpacker meals that you just add water to, um, or, you know, going out to eat a lot or going through drive throughs or, you know, pre-made meals and that sort of thing. And I don't do that. Um, I mean, when I backpack, I take backpacking food. When I'm in the van, I want to eat real food. It's my home. I'm not camping like an, like it's an event. I'm camping like it's a lifestyle. So this is my life. Um, I recently wrote an article for Vegetarian Times um, all about how I eat healthy in the van with no refrigeration or running water. And I'll link to that in the show notes as well. Um, but right now, I'll, you know, I'll just give you a little lowdown. I've been a vegetarian for over 13 years. I don't need to store meat or anything that like really needs to stay cold, cold, cold. So my cooler is fine. I don't have a fridge. I just have a Yeti. Um, and that's fine. 
And when I even first moved into the van, I didn't even have the Yeti. I had like this really, really cheap old Coleman cooler that I had gotten for free and was like trying to get rid of multiple times over the years and didn't. And I'm glad I didn't because it worked in the van for a while and then I had to upgrade. But basically, I don't have to keep things super duper cold, which is a huge benefit. Um, I eat mostly according to the weather. And so, you know, not just the seasons, not just when things are in season or whatever, but I also buy according to what the temperatures are. Um, personally, I really hate buying ice for my cooler, so I almost never do that. I don't like buying ice because it takes up so much space in the cooler and because when it melts, then it's like a mess. I've had my cooler leak and like get my whole floor soaking wet and then, you know, the items in the cooler can get waterlogged and it's just gross. So I just try really hard not to buy ice. Um, and so I buy according to that <laughs> as well. I'm really mindful about everything that I bring into my home and bring into my Yeti cooler. I hate wasting food. I always have. And so I just have to think about it a little bit more. I have to think about it in advance. I have to know what the weather's going to be like, what the temperature's going to be like, what my lifestyle's going to be like, what I'm going to have time to eat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so I really like having fresh fruits and vegetables on hand. And in the summer, I make sure that I buy the kind that are going to last a little bit longer anyway. They're a little bit more hearty like potatoes or Brussels sprouts or something like that. In the winter, because it's already cooler, I have a lot more flexibility and food is going to last longer anyway. And so to keep the cooler cool without buying ice, I prop the lid open at night and I close it during the day. And most of the time, you know, 10 months out of the year, uh, this is a really great system. It works for me. Um, in the winter, it can I can have the opposite problem depending on where I am, <clears throat> where things are freezing and I have to put them in the cooler so that they don't freeze, etc., etc. <laughs> but in the summer, I tend to buy less produce more often so that it's not going to go bad before I have the opportunity to eat it. And that should wrap up some of the basic, most frequently asked logistical questions that I get about my lifestyle in the van, about some of the most common questions people have, um, and especially once you start getting more into, like, all right, I'm going to move into a van. How do I do this? Okay, now how do I do this? Like, So hopefully that has helped, and it's all kind of wrapped up in one neat little episode for you. If you have additional questions, as always, please feel free to leave them in the comments or shoot me a private message. I'll do my best to answer you, you know, as soon as you send it. Uh, and then also I might address it in a future episode as well. So again, Holly Priestley, Deliberate Living uh, Podcast, audience supported. If you want to help us keep going and growing, I would love that. And I hope you guys uh, tune in for another excellent episode next week. Bye. We've reached the end of this episode of Deliberate Living. You can find the show notes and everything we referenced over on my website at www.hollycpriestley.com and be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube where I also publish weekly blogs and other informative videos. You can come join my Patreon community and get behind the scenes and bonus content as well as postcards, stickers, and whatever else I choose to create. I'll see you next week on Deliberate Living and until next time, keep your life on the D.